have always tried to encode secrets. Military communication. Love letters. Forbidden knowledge. Sooner or later, most secret texts have been decoded. But among all of history's cryptic writings, one has stood out. This text has defied all attempts to unveil its secret for centuries. The Voynich Manuscript. It's the mysterious book written by an unknown author in an absolutely singular alphabet and illustrated with puzzling images. What is the secret hidden between these lines? Yet another expert has taken on the challenge. For the first time, the physical materials of the Voynich manuscript will be analyzed. Maybe ink, pigments and parchment will offer a key to the Voynich enigma. At the headquarters of the U.S. Military Intelligence Service, these experts succeeded in decoding Japan's so-called Purple Code. William Friedrich Friedman, the service's director, was one of the world's best cryptographs. For practice between jobs, Friedman and his team decoded historical cryptic texts. One by one, the codes were cracked. But one ancient text stubbornly defied all attempts to decode it. The Voynich Manuscript. Unnerved, the cryptographs gave up. It's the only code they were unable to crack. Questions about the roughly 200-page manuscript with its inexplicable symbols had already been raised for decades. At the beginning of the 20th century, an antiques dealer from New York visited Villa Mondragone near Rome. He was looking for precious books. The name of the American dealer was Wilfred Voynich. In Villa Mondragoni, many historical texts from a Jesuit school were stored. One of the trunks Wilfred Voynich was allowed to inspect came from the estate of one of the most famous learned men of the 17th century, Athanasius Kircher. Among various manuscripts, the trunk contained an unusual book. Voynich bought the manuscript and tried to decipher it for the rest of his life. He died without even coming close to a solution. After Voynich's death, the tome ended up at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale. This library boasts a wealth of bibliophilic gems, but probably none as famous as the Voynich Manuscript. One of the leading experts on the Voynich Manuscript is René Zandbergen. He has been working on it for years. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can I help? I have come to see the Voynich Manuscript. Okay, it put you for I have. When I first saw an image of a page of the Voynich Manuscript, I immediately had the feeling, this is something that I can decipher, this is something I can read. But as the years went by, 
this turned out to be wrong. So I couldn't read it like so many other people before me. Thank you, Library Officer Rosemont. How may I help? Stand by transferring. The precious manuscript is kept in a secure place at the Beinecken Library. For the first time, René Zandbergen can inspect the original. And the really amazing thing is that somebody probably wrote something many hundreds of years ago and still with modern technology we still cannot decipher this. On more than 200 pages of parchment, the universe of a million graphic details and some 170,000 characters unfolds. In this tangle of text and images, an expert's eye can easily get lost. And then there were the drawings of the strange names. Yes. Yeah. The other interesting thing about the manuscript is it allows for so many different interpretations. There are so many drawings, so many figures. You can think of, of any theory and you will find evidence in the manuscript that fits this. This is really amazing. A closer look, however, makes the manuscript appear somewhat less confusing. The drawings help to break down the book into separate sections. Restorator Paula Zayats has spent many hours over the manuscript. Now we can't read the text, but we can guess probably what the book is about from the illustrations. So. It seems to consist of several sections. I'd say the greater preponderance of text in, the, in this book has to do with um, botanicals, herbals. It's clearly a book about these plants. It shows their root systems, their leaves, their flowers. Some of the drawings even seem to be inspired by reality. I would assume that what it says probably talks about where you're going to find this plant, how it grows, and then what can you use it for. Medicine was based on herbs. So another big part of medicine at that time is also included in the book. It's zodiac charts, star charts, you know, the sky. And it's page after page of these zodiacal drawings that are very detailed and very specific, and of course, again, we can't really tell what they say. But even here, there are astonishing parallels to natural shapes. Some of the book's pages also contain optical phenomena. If set into a spinning motion, these illustrations come to life. What does this combination of plants and astronomical symbols mean? In the Middle Ages, if you were to be treated herbally, you had to know what your zodiac sign was. And then there's the, the ladies. They start a little later on. Ladies tumbling through pools of green water. These bathing scenes are particularly puzzling. Could this be taken as a hint at a collection of recipes for a bathing cure, or even at the secret of the Fountain of Youth? Other illustrations seem to support that view. And then it's followed by this section towards the end, I guess it looks like recipes, um, where things look as though this is how you need to cut up your herbs that you've just seen on the preceding pages and this is what you need to cook them in perhaps or pound them with. So I don't know, I mean just to someone who knows nothing at all, it sure looks like an herbal, a medical book.
was the author a medical genius trying to hide his discoveries from competitors? Or from the Holy Inquisition, which would often rigorously root out new knowledge? It was Wilfred Voynich himself who discovered the first track leading to the anonymous author. He was busy making reprographs of the original when, by accident, an item appeared that had been invisible. Someone had written something on the first page. The words had been scratched from the parchment, but under ultraviolet light, traces of ink become visible. But I can see a T. T starting with Ted Bennett's. Mm. Something underneath. Jacobus a Ted Bennett. It's, it's fairly clear. Number, number 19, maybe? Jacobus Antepanich was a traveling doctor and expert in medical plants in the 17th century. His preparations were famous far and wide. In 1608, he was summoned to Prague by Emperor Rudolf II. The emperor often suffered from depression and melancholia. Tepanich's famous herbal extracts were to relieve the monarch's distress. Tepanich experimented with herbs. He grew them, distilled extracts, mixed them with alcohol, and made a fortune. His alcoholic remedies seem to have buoyed the emperor's well-being. To thank Tepanich, the emperor raised him to the gentry and appointed him imperial chief distiller. But why should a doctor encode his recipes? Groups who were involved in the practice of healing could easily get themselves in trouble with, with the church and with authorities. Kevin Rep is the curator of the Beinecke Library's manuscript collection. Alchemy was um, very closely related to the growth of science in the early modern period. And yet at the same time, alchemy was considered to be an extremely arcane topic, meaning the information that was recorded in these texts was often considered to be extremely secret. Jacobus Atepanich. Was he the originator of the world's most mysterious manuscript? Concerning the plant illustrations, one will notice that most of them do not correspond to any natural plant. Details are out of proportion or reminiscent of parts of the human anatomy or of abstract symbols. They appear to be allegorical images rather than botanical illustrations. This type of plant representation dates back to the Middle Ages. The medieval tradition was not or to represent them realistically or naturalistically, but rather to represent them in terms of the powers that these particular plants possess. However, in the early 17th century, illustrations were different. Plants were depicted in a much more realistic manner. If we're talking about 
a book that was written in the 16th or 17th century, you would expect it to be much more similar to a book like this. This book is from 1562, and as you can see, there's a much greater emphasis made on precision. You can identify these plants. Such aspects of art history were not considered at the time of Tepanich. He would only have worked in the style of his own time. Even though his name is found on the first page, it's unlikely that he was the author. Other books from his estate bear almost identical signatures. Surely at some point, the Voynich manuscript was in his possession. But the manuscript must have been written at a much earlier time. One decisive hint comes from a letter that was found together with the manuscript. This is a very important letter. It was written in 1665 by the Bohemian doctor Johannes Marcus Marzi. He is sending it to his good friend Athanasius Kirchi in Rome, who was a universal scientist and believed to be able to understand all languages in the world. Marzi sends him the book in order to have it translated. The interesting thing is that in this letter we also learn a bit more about the past of the manuscript. Marzi heard from a friend that it was once bought by the Bohemian Emperor Rudolf II of Habsburg for the sum of 600 ducats. Emperor Rudolf II was known for sponsoring the sciences. However, in his day, no distinction was made between natural science and magic. Rudolf had a gigantic collection of occult books and magical instruments and objects. He spent huge amounts of money for his collection, which also included the Voynich manuscript. When Rudolf died, he left behind great debt. Jakobus Atepanich seems to have been one of his creditors. He must have been compensated with objects from the Emperor's library. This is how the Voynich manuscript probably came into his possession. The letter to the universal genius Athanasius Kircher contains another hint at the manuscript's origin. The letter even names the book's author, Roger Bacon. Roger Bacon was a famous English learned clergyman in the 13th century with a telling sobriquet. Dr. Mirabilis, the miracle doctor. Bacon's insights greatly exceeded the horizon of his contemporaries. His urge for new discoveries frequently got him into conflict with the church. He was imprisoned at various times. As one of the first Europeans, he was interested in optical phenomena. He found an explanation for the rainbow. He also experimented with the reflection and refraction of light. Among other things, Roger Bacon worked with magnifying glasses. Many drawings in the astrological section of the Voynich manuscript resemble shapes that are normally only seen through a microscope. Are these the very first insights into a heretofore hidden world?
That would also explain the encoding. Because of his discoveries, Bacon must have worried about being persecuted as an infidel. Roger Bacon experimented with lenses to correct visual problems. Were his lenses also capable of stronger magnification? Richard Santa Coloma has investigated the optical phenomena contained in the manuscript. At the time of Roger Bacon, the microscopes did not exist that could make the type of detailed observations that are seen in the Voynich manuscript. It wasn't until the early 17th century when Cornelius Drebbel developed a complex, sophisticated uh, twin convex lens microscope where we, where we would be able to see the types of things which seem to be reflected in, in these images. So do you think this could be a kind of scientific notebook? Well, I did think at first that it may be some type of notebook with actual observations through the microscope and microscopic experiments by Cornelius Drebbel. But over time, I came to believe more that the Voynich was a fantasy document. There were too many fantasy elements. In fact, most of the illustrations appear detached from conditions of reality. Do they reflect a longing for a place of fantasy? A place that 17th century minds imagined somewhere in the deep past? Well, at the time that Cornelius Drebbel was in London, there was a tremendous interest in the idea of the ancient book of mysterious knowledge. If anyone were to create such um, a book as the Voynich, they would have ended up with a very valuable document that would have garnered them great prestige and possibly um, been able to sell for a great deal of money. So perhaps the Voynich manuscript is a purely decorative object a perfectly created illustration of a mysterious ancient book. Even today, looking through a microscope can open up new perspectives. Paula Zayetz is surprised by the perfect technical execution of the illustrations and text characters. And not only that. The surface of the parchment is very smooth and undisturbed. I don't see any abrasion. I don't even see any corrections. In other words, 200 pages of text have been written without the slightest error, an almost superhuman feat. This raises a suspicion. There's only one source of information about the discovery of the manuscript, Wilfried Voynich himself. Perhaps this successful dealer in antique books could not resist the temptation of creating such a singular, extremely precious book by his own hand. Several people have suspected that Voynich could have been a fraud. A very wide page. It's all the different signs of the zodiac. Meanwhile, modern material science has the tools to find out. Microscopy expert Joseph Barabi will investigate the manuscript. He and his team have exposed numerous forgeries. To determine whether an old manuscript is genuine or a much later forgery, what would you be looking for? Which are the indications that would help you? Well, the, the first thing we'll do is look at it and uh, uh, see if any of the working methods are inappropriate for the time period. But mostly we would be looking at the materials so let's look for a page with some good pigments. Okay. We have many choices here. They're all looking pretty good. Through the yeah, microscope, I like the manuscript's one. hidden beauty is revealed. This fantastic micro-world harbors information that can prove whether the book is genuine or a hoax. I'll be taking uh, a group of small samples, and the analytical methods that we use then uh, range from light microscopy, which gives us a look at just what it looks like, and we do elemental analysis on the particles. 
and that tells us what it consists of. We also look at the chemistry using spectrographic methods and crystallographic methods, and that gives us a picture of what it is. Basically, what we're trying to determine during our examination is how the object was constructed, because if it's a forgery, most forgers will make stupid mistakes. Okay. But we get it from these ridges at the top. Very good. Joseph Barabi samples paint and ink from various portions of the manuscript. That would be a mineral pigment. Mm -hmm. uh, the green is more mysterious. Let's pick it up to the side. As if we're to waste even a single particle. So what we found was that the ink is in iron gall ink, and we found that it was made in several different batches because the constituents vary somewhat uh, from batch to batch. The blue is azurite, ground azurite, a very beautiful mineral pigment. Uh, the red is a, the red and the brown are iron earth pigments, uh, red ochre with hematite, uh, wonderful stuff. So in summary, what we found was that the materials uh, that constitute the writing and the painting of this document are completely appropriate to the 15th and 16th centuries. And more importantly, we did not find any materials that would indicate that it was a 19th or 20th century forgery. The paints and inks are proof that the Voynich manuscript is authentic. Centuries ago, color pigments were extremely costly. Preparing the colors was a matter of complex knowledge and skill. In many cases, Arabic gum was used to bind the pigments. Painting with mineral pigments is a technical challenge. Larger crystals have a stronger glow, but they are harder to apply than finely pulverized minerals. To get bright hues, as in the Voynich manuscript, the colors have to be applied with great care. In this, the artist was certainly skilled. In stark contrast, however, many of the drawings appear sloppy, even naive. Many figures in the manuscript, such as this little dragon, or the red-cheeked women, seem to be creations of an infant's hand. At the Beinecke Library, René Zandbergen meets Edith Sherwood, who proposes an astonishing theory. The first picture I ever saw of the manuscript was this one, and I assumed or developed the hypothesis that it was written by a young Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was a gifted child growing up in a wealthy family. From his early youth, he must have been practiced in the use of brush and pen. Does the Voynich manuscript contain his first illustrations? If you look at the quality of the drawing, and the quality of the drawing and the other pictures, you realize that they are not very sophisticated, and it was probably one of his first books done when he was a child. One page in particular hints at da Vinci. I saw this astrological picture which shows uh, 15 little nude ladies sitting in tubs, uh, some of them fairly obviously pregnant, and a ram representing the astrological symbol Aries. The 
Aries symbol could stand for the month of April. The Aries is surrounded by 15 obviously pregnant women. If each woman represents one day, the illustration could signify April 15th. The women are holding up stars, symbols of birth. One of the women is holding her star on a striped ribbon. She is standing in a 10 o'clock position. Has Leonardo da Vinci symbolized an important event? I was left with the impression that it was probably represented the birthday of Leonardo da Vinci. Was the Voynich manuscript an early exercise for the coded texts he would later produce? Leonardo was a genius, one of the greatest artists in human history. Even at an early age, he was an expert draftsman. The drawings in the Voynich manuscript, however, show no sign of early genius. And there's no reason to believe that this would not have been a youthful exercise. Paula Zayetz is convinced. Would this have been an expensive book? This book might have been a very expensive book. The pigments, particularly the, mini the mineral pigments that are used throughout, are of very good quality, um, especially as evidenced by the fact that we can still see them bright and clear. Parchment gets more expensive the larger the sheet. And this book contains a number of foldouts, including a full page fold out, uh, which, I, which is pretty unusual. When you start moving into parchment that are this size and larger, it has to be taken from the center of a piece of skin. That alone costs money. So you had to have someone with the means to obtain a fair quantity of good quality parchment, good quality pigments, and the amount of time that it would take to do this it really could be a couple of years um, worth of work. Apparently, the unknown author invested years of his life in a book which must have cost a fortune to produce. The information he put into it must have been of great value. So great, in fact, that it had to be encoded. What ways of encoding did the author have? An expert in historical codes, Gerhard Strasser, has the answer. The Caesar Code, originally used by Julius Caesar, was popular throughout the Middle Ages. A shift code wherein the alphabet is simply shifted forward by four digits so that A becomes D, B becomes E, etc. Easy to use and equally easy to crack. The Caesar code is the simplest method. All one has to know was by how many letters the alphabet has been shifted. To crack it, it takes a maximum of 25 attempts. Sicher war sie bestimmt nicht, deswegen schon um 1330 it was by no means safe, so around 1330, the papal court tried to create a code book, wherein strategic key words like Pope, Church or King were replaced by single characters. To decipher such a message, the receiver needed to have a list of the code words. When this method is used, it results in ever-growing code lists that are tedious to update. Another problem is the secure transfer of these lists from the sender to the receiver. Easier to handle and more efficient was the cipher disk. Several revolving rings with characters enabled the user to create more complex codes. The cipher square was a further development in the late 16th century. 
From a modern perspective, all these methods are rather simplistic. Nowadays, can old cipher system still cause us any problems, or can we easily solve them all? Today, with enhanced frequency analysis and computer-assisted decoding methods, we can easily crack coded texts up to the 17th, even the 18th century. For this we need a critical mass, 30 characters are not sufficient. Given that, and given that the plain text made sense, any coded text from that period can be deciphered. So does this profusion of characters represent a text that makes sense? To find out, all the 170,000 characters of the manuscript have been electronically evaluated. The distribution pattern of each character could then be compared to known patterns of natural languages. The result? Some characters do occur more often than others. Like, for instance, particular vowels in European languages. However, most elements of the Voynich text do not correspond to the phonetic patterns of any natural language. In spite of all the modern technical tools that have been applied, the mysterious manuscript has not yielded its secret. The code remains uncracked. Linguist Gordon Rugg still thinks he is on the right track. His focus is the author's motive. Is that it's a cipher text. To me, the fact that it's still not been cracked by modern cryptographic techniques makes it highly unlikely that there's any real cipher in there. So the Voynich manuscript may not even be an encoded message. The distribution patterns Gordon Rugg has found point in a different direction. Some of the features of the manuscript were very unusual in terms of human languages, but were exactly the things you'd expect if somebody was producing something artificially and trying to make it look like a language. Gordon Rugg supposes the unknown author merely wanted to create an impression that the book contained something mysterious. For this purpose, he may have used historical codes. One simple method is to use a thing called a card and grill. The key concept is you have the grill, which is a piece of card with holes cut in it in a particular pattern. In the cryptographic version, you put it over a text and it reveals the hidden message through the holes. But you can also use it to generate meaningless text by putting it over the table, reading out the word which is revealed through the holes, writing it down, moving it across, generating another word, writing that down, moving it across, and so on to the end of the grill, and then repeating the process. So using that method, you could generate text very swiftly and very efficiently, as fast as you could write it down. This would explain why the world's best cryptographs have failed to find a message. But who would produce such a book? The most likely suspect is an Elizabethan adventurer called Edward Kelly. Edward Kelly originally came from England. He was the town scribe of his hometown, but was fired for forging official documents. Allegedly, he had an ear cut off for punishment, a fact he hid for the rest of his life with hairstyles and hats. Kelly left England by the late 16th century and traveled the cities of Europe, pretending to be a learned man. As for why he might have done it, there are several possible explanations. One possible explanation is simply money. 
The Voynich manuscript was bought by Emperor Rudolf II for a very large amount of money. So if you could produce a manuscript that size quickly and efficiently, you could make a large amount of profit by selling it to Rudolf. Rudolf II had numerous scientists on his payroll, including crackpots, dazzlers, and imposters. Kelly saw his chance and offered his services to the emperor. He was an alchemist who claimed to have been able to produce gold from ordinary materials. Kelly claimed to be able to make gold with the help of his apparatuses. To check his ability, Emperor Rudolf had Kelly's tools inspected and the alchemist locked into a room. Kelly must have known that he was under observation. Of course, his mysterious alchemistic experiments never really produced gold, nor was this necessary, because Kelly had smuggled a tiny nugget into the room. The Emperor was obviously impressed. Kelly was hired. But there's other possible motivations as well as money. That somebody believed that the angels were talking to them, for example, to spell out some mystical words. <laughs> Kelly was experienced with such phenomena. On behalf of another Englishman, the mathematician John Dee, he contacted angels for some time. Of course, Kelly was the only person on earth who knew the language of the angels, and so he was able to dictate their words to a thrilled John Dee. Kelly used special characters, which he read from a magic table. The angelic language, of course, was pure fantasy. Allegedly, their collaboration abruptly ended when the angels told Kelly that he and Dee were to swap wives. In Kelly's case, he had the means, the motive, the opportunity, and the personality to hoax it. Everything points to Edward Kelly as the author of the Voynich Manuscript. He had previously invented a fantasy language. With Emperor Rudolf II, he had a financially potent as well as gullible buyer of his mysterious writings and formulas. Today, for the first time, we can convict the 16th century dazzler by using modern technology. Greg Hodgins of the University of Arizona will take several samples of the Voynich manuscript. The manuscript is written on animal skin, so its age can be precisely determined. Like any organic material, parchment can be dated by the radiocarbon method. The book was never before scrutinized in this way. Since relatively large samples are needed, the radiocarbon test had been refused for a long time. But now, for the first time ever, it is possible to determine exactly how old this mysterious manuscript really is. To ensure accuracy, Greg Hodgins takes four samples from four different pages. A few weeks later, the lab results arrive and they bring a big surprise for everyone. So there are the four measurements from the four samples that we took from the Voynich manuscript. 
And as you can see, the dates are very tightly clustered together. It gives a picture of it being created in a relatively short period of time. Moreover, because they're so tightly clustered together, it means we can treat it as one object that's been dated four times, and that increases the precision of the measurement. So the mean of those measurements and a, and a weighted average gives this result right here. So at 95% confidence, we can say the age of the Voynich manuscript is 1404 AD to 1438 AD. This result is sensational. It overthrows all the previous assumptions about the manuscript's origin. Neither Atepanich nor Roger Bacon could have been the authors. Leonardo da Vinci, too, was born half a century later. Even Edward Kelly now has a sound alibi. He lived one and a half centuries later. None of the existing theories had assumed the early 15th century to be the period of the manuscript's creation. All relevant methods of examination available today have been applied to the Voynich manuscript. It was written around 1420. With this new information, one detail in the manuscript gets a new meaning. On more than 200 pages filled with fantastic sceneries, there is only one realistic representation of a city. One with towers, walls and turrets. The ramparts are drawn with so-called swallowtail battlements. In combination with the manuscript's date of origin, these turrets take on a special significance. Later in history, swallowtail turrets were common across Europe. But in the early 15th century, they only existed in northern Italy. During the Renaissance period, northern Italy was one of the wealthiest and most influential regions of the Western world. This is the historical background of the manuscript's creation. Up to now, the research about the Voynich manuscript lacked a historical anchoring point. No one knew in which period or region the search could be started. Now, this has changed. We know where to look. It will be exciting to see what further references to the mysterious manuscript will be found in the archives between Milan and Venice. Having dated the book is a major step forward, increasing our chances to really understand the Voynich manuscript one day. For the time being, the Voynich manuscript remains what it has been for the last 600 years. It's a hall of mirrors reflecting each researcher's own imagination without ever allowing him a glimpse into its inner secrets.